Hello, everyone. I'm Rania Kalik, and this is Dispatches. The war in Ukraine has now lasted more than two months. And while we don't know the exact battlefield situation, what we do know is that a NATO military alliance that seemed to have no reason to exist has been rejuvenated, and a European Union that seemed to be fraying is at least briefly more cohesive, both under the leadership of America, which isn't even in Europe. It appears like a desperate last-ditch effort to halt American and Western decline, or even the end of the capitalist world order. Can it work? Here to discuss the future of Europe and of the Western-dominated order is the eminently qualified sociologist and prolific writer and author Wolfgang Streak, Emeritus Director at the Max Planck Institute for the Study of Societies. Wolfgang, welcome. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank, thanks for having me. Well, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate you giving us your time. And let's just get right into it. Um, I guess before we talk about Europe more generally, since you are in Germany, uh, maybe we should start there. Successive German governments have been accused of being too Russia-friendly, and successive American governments have been unhappy about the Nord Stream pipeline between Russia and Germany. And before the war in Ukraine, Germany seemed reluctant to allow the situation with Russia to escalate and was even attacked in the U.S. media. But then its government performed a surprising about face and has now embraced militarism and increased its military budget and taken on this very hawkish policy. No party, of course, more than the Greens, ostensibly an anti-war party. So can you explain to our listeners and viewers what happened with Germany in this regard? <laughs> if, if if I knew, uh, yeah, I, I, we we can have a have have a guess on this, no, and <laughs> and, and this is all, no, no. Starting from the fundamentals, of course, uh, the West Germany, and we still live in the in the political tradition of of West Germany, not not of East Germany, has has always seen itself in a particularly vulnerable position in in the center of of Europe. And this had something to do with the fact that the German Empire, the sort of predecessor state of uh, of uh, West Germany, uh, was unable during the Second World War to develop a nuclear bomb. Uh, the physicists did uh, their best to, uh, to 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 get one, but they were unable at the end to to complete the job. Thank God. <laughs> and and so so in the end, the, after 1945, it was clear. And then one of the conditions for Germany to rejoin the international community was that it would not have nuclear bombs. Mm. And, the, and in 19, 1968, uh, the West German government signed the Non-Proliferation Treaty. And uh, so the question came up, who is going to defend Germany in case there was a nuclear war? And there was only one candidate for this, which is the United States. Which, which are still uh, stationing around 40,000 40, troops on, on German soil and an unknown number of nuclear warheads. And uh, of course, the, uh, the required uh, um, the systems to deliver them. So uh, the Germany is, is both vulnerable uh, because it, it's a, it, it was a front state as West Germany, it's now a front state to an extent uh, uh, with, with, with Russia. And uh, any attempt in the past sort of 20, 30 years, or, or longer even, uh, to, uh, uh, to build a European sort of either peace regime or uh, defense regime or both, uh, the, 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 were a problem because the question always arose who is going to uh, jump in for the United States as uh, main military protector. Mm -hmm. And uh, the United States certainly didn't want to let anyone else jump in. Uh, the, the French have a nuclear force, but, but they are not going to share them uh, with the Germans of, of, of all people. And, and, and so, uh, the problem for Germany was always that it was somewhere in the middle and, and they couldn't quite trust the United States to actually use their nuclear power in order to save the Germans from the Russians. And, and uh, the, the French always, always were clear that they would not sacrifice Paris for Berlin. Uh, and and the, the strangeness of German defense policy 
and in, to an extent German foreign policy is sort of located in this uh, very fundamental condition. It's so interesting that, you, I mean, there's 40,000 American soldiers in Germany. Yeah, yeah. That I'm not sure if that actually is the most American soldiers stationed in a country outside, like in the world. It might be, it, there might be more somewhere else, but it's definitely in the top. I mean, I've heard people make the argument that in a sense, the fact that there are so many American military personnel in Germany kind of makes it like an occupied territory in a way by the United States, which gives the U.S. so much influence over what Germany does in its own foreign policy. Um, well, I don't know if do, you'd do agree. You, can say the occupation is, is, um, is probably not the right term be, be, because uh, uh, lots of people here desire that, that, mm. that presence. If you, if, if you ask uh, uh, the German political parties or wh whoever, then the vast majority would think that that they uh, they, they have this ambivalent attitude. On the one hand, they think they need them. On the other hand, they are not quite sure what they will do if they if they are to defend them. Yes. Uh, yeah. No. It's it's not okay. But uh, in in many ways, the United States still have a number of prerogatives uh, as far as Germany is concerned. And in these respects, Germany is not yet e even now. Uh, sort of sovereign state. In, for example, one of the biggest American air bases is in uh, in southwestern uh, Germany. And during the so-called War on Terror, uh, this was a place where these sort of numerous CIA airplanes sort of convened to transport uh, the, the various uh, sort of prisoners that they had taken uh, for uh, uh, enhanced rendition. Enhanced Interrogation, yeah, right. uh, and 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 the, the chief of staff of the chancellor's office in in Germany, who is at the same time uh, in charge of the secret services, so he he had to uh, approve each of uh, each and every sort of flight movement uh, in into Germany, and 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 so you know that there is uh, an, an an element of the Americans sort of uh, having the confidence. That when it comes to their uh, far-flung uh, military and uh, other otherwise uh, interests, uh, Germany is a safe base where they can do what they feel they have to do. That's a good way to put it. Um, and you know, I've I've seen you make this argument before. And I, before we get into the Ukraine stuff, I was just curious if if you could maybe make it here. Um, you know, is it right to see Europe itself as a kind of microcosm of the globe, with countries like Germany? Uh, and then I guess France as well, because, you know, Germany and France are sort of the leaders of, of Europe, but with countries like Germany acting as a kind of imperial core, or as you've written, the center of this liberal economic empire, and then countries like Greece or Bulgaria as a kind of periphery? Yeah, no, no, we, we have to, this is a, a historical story, as as all of these things are. Uh, after the After the war, in war-torn Europe, where uh, people were starving and and everything had to be sort of rebuilt, and also one had to find a place for for Germany in a new international regime, then then began this development of what is now called the European Union, with only six states uh, in in 1958 that agreed on uh, simply a joint administration of the two industries that at the time were seen as absolutely crucial, uh, coal and steel. <laughs> to, 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 today it would be microchips or, or, or something. And, and then from this on, uh, during the time, uh, during times, uh, uh, this uh, uh, association of, of, uh, of, of states began to grow into, in the 1990s, into the so-called internal market, which was a sort of a microcosm of a deregulated, uh, uh, economy in which states would no longer, or, or national poli policy politics would no longer play a role, mm -hmm. and where the management of the capitalist economy would be turned over to either the market or, or to, to the market certainly, and, and to a sort of international technocracy. Mm -hmm. uh, the European Commission, the European Central Bank, uh, the European Court of Justice. During this time, the thing assumed another 
uh, important function in addition to sort of the neoliberal uh, liberation of uh, of the economy from the nation state so to speak uh, the the additional function was to absorb the uh, uh, successor states of the soviet union and of uh, yugoslavia uh, into the western system and in this process uh, of course enormous differences arose inside that thing called European Union uh, where where we now have uh, 27 uh, member states rather than just six and quite a few of them have national interests that are distinctly different from those of the core they are very close to to Russia uh, they are at the same time trying to get into the capitalist business uh, be, because there's no alternative anymore. And, and uh, uh, yeah, so, so now these uh, uh, states in, insert an element of uh, uh, political interest into the European Union, which are very, very hard to accommodate from the center. There's also economic uh, interests. All of these states differ uh, enormously from the uh, economic uh, structures and uh, prosperity of, of, of Western Europe. You have a country like Bulgaria and you have a country like Sweden in the same thing. Now, can you govern them from the center? No, what you get is uh, the periphery looks eagerly at the center and waits for some sort of development support or, 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 or something. The elites in the peripheral countries, but very many of them have basically given up the idea that they could uh, take care of themselves. They, they become sort of dependent on the, on the uh, help that they expect from the center. That sort of dependency uh, inserts an element of uh, sort of internal politics into the European Union, which, which is very, very difficult. And then, of course, I, I've always argued, and I, I think that is completely uh, traceable in, in current events, that uh, the problem with this, if, if, if you want empire, empire is a collection of states with a sort of gradient of power between them. And mm. an empire, in order to hang together, needs a center. And, and the center needs to pay for the costs of keeping the empire together. Uh, if peripheral states have a, have a chance, they can begin to bargain. Oh, we, we could become Chinese allies and, and, and unless you do something for us. Yes. And, and then someone will have to pay for it. As Americans, you, you, I think you fully understand what that means. The United States initially uh, uh, sort of benefited from being an imperial power for, for mo most of the world. And then it became more and more expensive. You have to pay for troops. To keep that empire together, you you have to educate the elite so that they believe in you rather than in some in something else, and 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 you have to have give them have to give them trade privileges like the Americans gave to the Chinese in the early 1990s when they wanted the Chinese to join the American Empire as a dependent uh, uh, state. In all these situations, there comes a point when the center finds the empire too expensive. Mm. Not necessarily the elites of the center, but the but, but the masses, like in the United States, the, the people living in the Midwest, they they just don't understand what what the United States are doing in Thailand or or something. They, right. they they want something for them for <laughs> to, to be done for them. The, that's what I understood. Uh, uh, Trump signals when he when he said something like America first. Okay. Now, now you have an advantage over Europe in the following sense. There's only one. There's only one uh, center in the American Empire. It's declining, but but there's one center, which is the United States. Whereas in in in, in Europe, uh, the relevant states would be Germany and France, and they are too small. Each of them is too small. So you would have to have a sort of, as they say in Europe, the tandem of. Uh, of, uh, of Europe, uh, France and Germany together, but but they have too uh, too many uh, different interests. The the, uh, the 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 French are interested in their former colonies in in in, in Africa, mm -hmm. and they also see for themselves and for Europe. Uh, Europe basically is an extension of France. Yeah. Ah. They 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 see for you yeah yeah in 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 order to be a player on the world scale you have to have a little more muscle 
than 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 France alone has. So, you, so for example, Macron won this uh, election a, a few days ago with the slogan "An independent France in a strong Europe." If you listen to this for a while, then 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 you understand what it means. It means France acts with the resources of Europe and thereby becomes stronger. Yeah, the Germans would never say such a thing, but they uh, they believe also in uh, let's say. Uh, Europe being an extension of Germany, meaning meaning sort of um, economic growth oriented, uh, um, manufacturing oriented, um, sort of austere public spending, and and all of these things, and combined with a sort of uh, yeah pseudo pacifist tradition from the from the Second World War. Yeah, which the France, the French don't have at all. The, the, the French have nuclear submarines, and and uh, they, they kept urging the Germans to to buy or, or to build together with them a thing that that is called FCAS, Future Combat Aircraft System, which consists not just of aircraft; it also has drones and it has satellites. And 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 it's the most expensive uh, aircraft system uh, in fighter bomber system in the world, and and it, the the idea is that it can sort of sort of act any time at any place in the world. So that's a French idea. If yeah. if if you tell this a German general or or a German minister, they would think they would think that's 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 pretty that's pretty pretty crazy. <laughs> And, and um, however, they wouldn't say so because, in the name of friendship with with France, they they are even willing to pay a few dollars, sort of on the side, in in, in order to keep the French happy with the development work in this thing, never believing that it can ever work. And interestingly, Marine Le Pen wanted to cancel this project. It, mm. it, it's it's interesting to to find out whether whether uh, Macron will will still p pursue it. Yeah, that will be interesting to see. But I mean, okay, so moving on to like all of what we're talking about in the context yeah. of what's taking place in Ukraine, you've written, I mean, you've written quite a bit about um, the U.S.'s role in helping provoke this war. Um, obviously, the U.S. alone didn't provoke it, but it's like they didn't do anything to stop it. They did kind of almost, and now that the war is taking place, you continue to hear from the, from Biden himself, from other um, people like the U.S. Secretary of Defense, that now they're using this war in an effort to weaken Russia, right? They see Ukraine as like a weapon to weaken the Russians. And it's one thing, you know, for the U.S. to maybe provoke this war. As you say, actually, it can afford to be reckless in its foreign policy, given its size. And I'm quoting you here, its location on a continental sized island where yeah. nobody can get to them, regardless of the mess they make when their yeah. military adventures go wrong. But Wolfgang, surely European governments could not have wanted to risk a war so close to home because they're yeah. actually on the front lines here. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and th there are things that I don't understand in the in the prehistory of this. And and at, at some stage, historians will, ha will have to clear this up. For example, a couple of years ago, uh, even even in the last e even uh, five, six, seven years ago. Uh, after after ukraine uh, after uh, uh, russia captured uh, the, the the crimean pe peninsula there was this format of of negotiations on on the future of ukraine which in the, the normandy format it was sometimes called uh, which resulted in the so-called minsk uh, uh, accord between between germany france well, two of them: Germany, France, uh, Russia, and and Ukraine, and uh, the, the, no United States in sight. Yeah, it and and it had some sort of pretty reasonable ideas mm -hmm. that uh, up to uh, a few months ago uh, were shared by at least ostentatiously, ostentatiously uh, shared by both uh, the Russians and the Ukrainians. Which was, let's set aside uh, uh, the Crimea and talk about it later. Second, neutralize uh, uh, Ukraine as a whole by making sure that it would not, uh, or, or assuring everyone that it would not uh, join NATO. Mm -hmm. uh, thirdly, 
um, a federal structure for Ukraine that that would give the uh, the Russian speaking parts of the country uh, considerable um, degrees of self uh, of self government. Right now, that was there, there were nuances about all of this, uh, and of course, details would would have to be worked out. But there was there were some details already. This this guy who is now uh, the favorite enemy of the of, of the Ukrainians, who is, happens to be now president of the Federal Republic of Germany, a man named Frank Walter Steinmeier, his name uh, uh, in, in 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 Ukraine. Uh, was known for not just be having been a German foreign minister who who, who worked in this um, in this Normandy f- format uh, and 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 helped bring about this the, these Minsk agreements, but also what he um, uh, sort of invented was was what is called the Steinmeier Steinmeier logarithm algorithm <laughs> <laughs> algorithm the Steinmeier algorithm which is sort of a roadmap. To the realization uh, of uh, uh, the Minsk Accord, and and this has made him the the favorite enemy uh, of the ultra nationalist wing of the Ukrainian political spectrum, uh, which never wanted this sort of thing, and mm-hmm. and I'm sure that the United States were f- felt like uh, Europe had taken advantage of the sort of the the, the Trump. Uh, dark hole, so to speak, in in American foreign policy, and 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 put together this particular format, which excluded the United States, and and now politicians never say what they think, so so it's very very hard to know why they did this, but you can always add two and two, and in this case it was four. The the uh, the what what you find what what you see immediately is that there was this attempt to. To to uh, find a European solution mm. to a problem uh, among parties that are much more deeply affected by whatever the result is than the United States, we have a vital interest in there not being a war. The United States uh, can have a war in Syria, they can have a war in Libya, they can have a war wherever there is a war, but. But nobody, will ever, as, I, as I recently wrote, they, they, they do not have to fear an Iraqi army uh, marching into Washington, D.C. and demanding right. um, uh, George Bush to be delivered to the International uh, Criminal Court in, uh, in, in Den Haag, where he belongs. Uh, right? the, the, only, the only reason why he isn't there in a cell is that the United States are so strong, and mm-hmm. that they also uh, have never signed the uh, knowing <laughs> why ne- never signed the protocol for the International Criminal Court, like the Russians have never signed it. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it is. It is. It just seems so crazy to me that the Europeans at this point have simply allowed, maybe they have no choice. They've like the U.S. to to be a part or to to basically deal with Russia yeah, over yeah, what are yeah. purely European issues. Power of attorney. I mean, basically, at some stage in the last year, the Americans were given or took hold of power of, of the power of, of attorney uh, to speak point. for Western Europe in this particular conflict. And that's one of that's one of the mysteries. I, I think that also came together with um, an, a, a rise in the political strength on the part of the uh, very radical nationalist wing uh, of the uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, political mm. spectrum. In Ukraine, t- see the, the, the present president, uh, Zelensky, he was e- elected um, surprisingly uh, with a sort of I, I don't know, almost three quarters of the vote Right. On a platform that was pretty close uh, to the Minsk uh, Accords, and 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 during the election campaign, he promised that he would devote all his uh, uh, power and 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 whatever he had uh, in order to uh, to uh, realize uh, to to bring to a good end uh, the the Minsk uh, negotiation. Suddenly, nobody talks about Minsk anymore. If if in this country, in Germany, you. You, you you go to a public 
discussion and say, hi, by the way, by the way, where are the Minsk Accords? Then, then, they, then they look at you like you were sort of condoning uh, uh, the, the war crimes of, um, of, of Monsieur Putin. Yeah, it, it's, the, 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 the thing has completely disappeared uh, out of sight. Now, yeah. now it is, now it is the question uh, uh, to work out while at war uh, what the war, uh, what the war aims of the West are basically dictated by the Americans. And indeed, you mentioned the visit of these two American uh, uh, secretaries of uh, the, the foreign secretary and the secretary of the of, of, of defense uh, in uh, Ukraine, where they suddenly sort of put uh, the goalpost a little bit further uh, uh, away. Now, the, one of the mysteries, that, <laughs> talking about mysteries, one of the mysteries is how the, how the, the, the Russian general staff could have believed. Uh, they, they must have spies in Ukraine. So, so they must have known that the Ukrainian army uh, since the, the, the 2014, since since the the um, the Crimea thing, was basically rebuilt and retrained by American instructors, right? Uh, up to up to a point where uh, this sort of uh, wonderful formula of the interoperability of the local uh, military forces uh, with those of NATO and the United States was triumphantly achieved. Uh, a year ago. Well, you know, one more of the sort of reckless and rash acts that seems to be taking place here is this kind of breathless competition to see who can pour more weapons into Ukraine. And this seems to be about prolonging the war. I mean, it's actually, yeah. it's not, we don't even have to guess. It's the Americans are openly saying that, that this war continuing is beneficial for them. And of course, this means prolonging the war at the expense of Ukrainian lives. It reminds me very much of the Syrian conflict where you had something similar people just pouring weapons in to prolong the war. The longer the war goes on, the more it weakens Assad. In the case of you know, Ukraine, the longer the war goes on, the more it weakens Russia. Do you think that NATO is really that cynical or do they really think that Ukraine can defeat the Russians? And moreover, are you concerned over the future blowback from pouring so many weapons in this very chaotic fashion with very unpredictable results to what well, it was before this war continues to be, I mean, the most corrupt country in Europe, which, which yeah. is full of like mafias and militias. <laughs> <laughs> if you say this in this country, my God, no. I no, mean, it's no. just a fact, though. It's a yeah, fact. Like, what's going to happen to all these weapons? But yeah, I assume it's probably like taboo to even. Yeah, it's yeah. taboo. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. But, but you're completely right. No, I, I think uh, uh, even if, uh, I mean, if you think, that the ultra right uh, part of the nationalist uh, uh, movement in Ukraine gets uh, a hold over the government, maybe by toppling the present president and and uh, and, and taking over. That's that's I think a possibility as the war uh, uh, drags on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you think about this, then uh, the madness uh, can rule uh, not just in uh, Moscow; it can also rule in Kiev. Uh, for example, a willingness to take as many uh, uh, casualties on, on your own side uh, in, in order to forge out of the uh, war a united uh, uh, new Ukrainian nation. It has happened in the past that uh, uh, ultranationalists uh, sort of believe in the theory that a nation rises out of the blood of its uh, uh, children or sons or people. Uh, an interesting question, uh, adding to the questions that I mentioned, is that uh, as Germany and other countries are pouring, as you say, these amounts of uh, uh, treasure and, uh, and weaponry, uh, into Ukraine, they do not seem to have, and they do not even seem to claim a right to uh, determine uh, what the objectives of the war are going to be. Are they uh, uh, the uh, the Minsk Accord? Are they uh, uh, 
pushing uh, the the Russians out of uh, the Russian-speaking parts of Ukraine. Are they to get back uh, uh, the the peninsula? What is the objective? Now, in the course of a war, objectives change. All the more important it is that as an ally who is an important supporter uh, and, and on whose support so much depends, uh, that you have some sort of channel to talk to, let's say, the local commander or your, your ally and to find out, look, friends, uh, how far do we want to go? What is, what is the point where we take a breath and tell this man, Putin, uh, we are now willing to talk seriously about this? Yeah? Uh, the, the, I don't know what they are doing because if, even if they are doing it, they have to do it in secret and I respect that. But from, from what I see, uh, I think that these goalposts are being uh, uh, moved uh, by the United States alone. Yeah. Uh, discuss why? Why send these two ministers together uh, to Kiev uh, in a sort of surprise visit with very little uh, sort of press uh, uh, re reporting on 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 what was going on? Something must have had to do. Uh, with what uh, the two sides want to achieve. If I was a German <laughs> chancellor, I would really want to know mm -hmm. what they have talked about. Yeah. yeah. Will they yeah. tell me? No, no, of course not. They they will tell me that I have to send more heavy weaponry. Right. You know, do you think at this point that we can even distinguish between the European Union and NATO or have they become like one entity? Yeah, that is. Um, I, I think uh, if if you look at the fine print, so to speak, then then uh, of course the, the the big print is they are in different fields. The one does military things, the other does economic things. But uh, uh, more importantly, because military and and, and economy, as uh, Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels have have told us, <laughs> hang together uh, very uh, uh, closely. Yeah. But uh, uh, what we what we can see is that uh, if 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 we take a look, then the, while the Americans are in NATO and in fact they are running NATO, they are not in the European Union. Mm. So for the uh, for the for the Americans, the European Union was always sort of an an, an interesting complex uh, animal. Uh, on the one hand. Henry Kissinger always complained that if he want, if he has to talk to Europe, uh, he has to talk, he has to have six or seven or ten different telephone numbers, and it's so utterly uh, time uh, a waste of time. What, wouldn't it be much better if there was just one telephone number in in, in Europe, so that he could, uh, I mean, negotiate with them? He said, but but of course, what he meant is issue a command to, and and that would simplify the, the line of command. But uh, uh, it, it indicates that uh, this European Union was, on the one hand, something that the Americans would have very much liked. Uh, to the extent that it was at their service, so to speak. At the same time, they were always afraid that that for reasons of different national interests or uh, what, whatever, uh, the, the, the different collective interests even, uh, uh, they would uh, uh, sort of beg uh, to differ from, uh, from American uh, policy. Um, so when we could go through all this the, the, when when Italy and and uh, when when Spain and, and Portugal uh, it sort of ended the uh, fascist period in the mid 1970s, then the Americans insisted that they enter the European Union and NATO at the same time. Uh, the, the European Union to pep them up sort of economically, and and NATO in order for the American planes to be able to uh, to sort of land in Madrid and 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 and, and, and wherever. So so yes, uh, now now I think 
this sort of undecided, uh, always sort of uh, fragile uh, relationship between NATO and the European Union has, has been settled. The uh, European Union is becoming sort of the auxiliary, the subsidiary of, the, of NATO for economic purposes. And, and, and the, the battle is about which countries to, are allowed to enter the European Union. And, and the crucial case is, again, Ukraine. As, as you described, the condition of Ukraine. And I mean, I mean, look, the European Union is not totally averse to corruption. There are uh, member states in the European Union which are unbelievably corrupt, like, like Malta and, 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 and Cyprus and Bulgaria and Romania. Yeah? But Ukraine is still a different class. It's, it's sort of a clearly post-Soviet uh, oligarchic uh, mm -hmm. political political economy, with six or seven big oligarchs. Um, I mean, I mean, now that this guy Musk is buying Twitter, <laughs> uh, you you consider this as as unusual. But in 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 Ukraine, all the major news channels are owned by some of the major uh, 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 oligarchs. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you have an oligarch who owns Twitter, but there you have 10 oligarchs who Actually, own. actually, not to, to give credit where it's due in America, I think five companies own 90% of the media. So we have something slightly <laughs> different. It's not too far off, though. Not too far off. But certainly we have, we have a lot of monopolies in the U.S., but... Um, I guess not quite as much as maybe a, a, a country like Ukraine does, but sorry, continue. Yeah, yeah, oh, oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't, no, no, I, I wasn't. <laughs> I, I, I wasn't saying. I, I was only saying that uh, for you, uh, the, the, the idea that one of the big, big industrialists buys up one right. of the most important news channels um, is something like like you you wonder about it. Mm -hmm. Whereas in these countries, it, it is natural. It's normal, it, right? It's normal. It's, there's, there's nothing wrong with it because it's it's the usual practice. Yeah. Now, now in in this in this case, uh, the, 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 Ukraine is about to join uh, the European Union because the Americans are pressing for it. The the population in Europe thinks we want to do something for them. Uh, the European Union is eager to to show that they also do something for their friends in the United States and everyone. In other words, if they enter, then uh, a lot of other countries that are now on the waiting list uh, will also enter. Uh, do you, you cannot deny uh, Moldova uh, to enter the European Union if 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 you allow Ukraine. Right. Now, so, so that will change the nature of the, of the European Union to a very, very fundamental sense in the direction that began with the uh, absorption of the former Soviet uh, uh, com communist states. Mm -hmm. In other words, uh, there, are, there will be many more client countries that need to be fed out of the, the common pot. The pot, common pot will have to get bigger. That increases... Uh, uh, conflicts within the union, not just between poor and rich, but also inside the more or less rich, which is especially Italy and and the Mediterranean countries. They will bleed for the extension uh, for for the for the additional uh, support that will have to go to to uh, to Eastern Europe. Mm. Uh, so yes, uh, I think that uh, tension has been settled, and and we now and I. I cannot but observe that the the Americans have hoped for this sort of solution for a very long time. They right. they, they, they call this the resurrection of the West. Yeah, I'm so I just don't I guess I I keep going back to this but I just don't understand it cuz there's so many like when I look at the role of the US and the consequences of US policy on Europe, particularly over the last 30 years, it's been so negative. Yeah, I mean, yeah. every war the US has launched in the Middle East has actually had great repercussions on Europe, whether it's like ISIS ideologues blowing themselves up themselves up in European cities, or Europe having to take on, you know, millions of refugees that really changed the, the yeah. economy and politics of, of many European countries and pushed them all, you know, further right, uh, and gave, you know, rise to a lot of these far right movements that have gain steam over the last few years. But, you know, in this case, I just, I don't understand how after all of that, plus now the consequences that you're talking about of, you know, having Ukraine enter the European Union, that's going to have negative economic consequences 
cause certain countries, like you mentioned, like Italy and others to bleed, if you will, and highlighting these big contradictions in the EU, I would think it would make the Europeans question their dependence on the US, but it doesn't seem to be having that effect. No. In fact, it's quite the opposite. And Europeans, you know, seem more, you know, seem to desire more U.S., you know, protection as they see it. Um, so it's just such an interesting yeah, contradiction. It's, it's, it's mad. And, and, and I, I would add that um, a year ago, when the Americans abandoned uh, uh, Afghanistan, yeah, uh, it is like a hundred years, but it's only... <laughs> it does feel that way, doesn't it? Yeah. And, and what, what happened here? We, uh, Germany had a battalion of, I think, 1,500 uh, troops stationed in, uh, uh, in, in Afghanistan. Right. Among the uh, service people, uh, there was the question, what in, what in the world are we doing here? Uh, we're far away from Afghanistan. The, once in a while, someone, some of us get, gets blown up. But, but we can sort of really seriously see that uh, uh, this is for nothing. At some stage, we'll be then the United States sort of left. They had announced that they would leave, but they hadn't announced on what particular day. Suddenly, everybody was gone. Our uh, our, our sort of <laughs> stupid defense minister in in, in Germany, you know, she publicly uh, uh, let it be known that uh, if the Americans abandon Afghanistan, we would not necessarily do the same. And maybe why, why don't we <laughs> why don't we stay there to uh, to complete the mission, so to speak? <laughs> with fifteen hundred, with fifteen hundred yeah, troops, totally, okay. totally ridiculous, yeah. And, <laughs> And uh, and then of course, then they removed everyone, and it was it was chaos. It was, and everybody blamed rightly, I think, the the United States for not having prepared this sort of thing, not necessarily for having left, but they, they haven't even told their 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 allies. The French were smarter than the Germans; they always are. So so they had left half a year ago. Half a year before the event, because they they knew something like this would be coming. The Germans like uh, uh, <laughs> stay there, stay in place, yeah, uh, solid uh, uh, and allies, and and this thing is completely forgotten. What is also forgotten, incidentally, is is Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. Why why do I mention Donald Trump? Because Donald Trump could in two years be uh, the next president of the United States, right. if if not he. Then maybe someone who acts in his spirit, if you can call it a spirit, yeah. Then yeah. so you make yourself dependent on an on a uh, uh, hegemonic country whose politics have become so screwed up, so unpredictable, uh, and so negligent of the interests of others, so self-centered, yeah, and. And suddenly, suddenly, all of this is forgotten. Yeah, overnight. It's oh. kind of like with, yeah, it's kind of like with the Iran deal, like the Biden administration, just you made me think of this with talking about how Trump could be president again in two years. One of the biggest obstacles to reinstituting or agreeing again to another Iran deal has been the U.S. telling the Iranians, we can't guarantee that this deal won't be ripped up again when the next yeah. person takes office. Um, yes. Yeah. And you know, yeah. that that said, I did want to ask you about another kind of blowback issue um, and just kind of to kind of continue on this theme of like the radical right, which we've mentioned a little bit. I mean, yes, the Russians have accused the Ukrainian, the Ukrainian state of being run by Nazis. This is, of course, you know, an exaggeration. But at the same time, you know, prior to the war, Ukraine already had the best organized and best armed neo-Nazi or, you know, radical right movement uh, in militias in Europe. And surely you know, these people have been galvanized by this war, especially as we're sending, you know, weapons, you know, a crazy amount of weapons and you have volunteers from around the world pouring in. I'm sure a certain segment of those volunteers are going for, you know, white supremacist reasons. So what is the role, do you think, of the Ukrainian right in your view? And do you know to what extent, or I guess, can you maybe speculate to what extent they might be connected to right-wing movements in Germany, like what will be the impact of, 
galvanizing the radical right in Ukraine on the radical right across Europe. Yeah, interesting, no? Um, yeah, no, the, uh, the, uh, the, the radical Ukrainian right in Germany is a bizarre story. And, mm. and uh, in the interwar years, the organization of Ukrainian nationalists uh, were uh, sort of a uh, uh, bona fide fascist movement uh, with uh, a fascist leadership, um, a, a man named uh, P Patera and another one named Melnik. Uh, th they sort of split in two. When the Germans moved into uh, Ukraine, uh, the German troops were uh, in some parts of the of the country jubilantly uh, greeted by the uh, uh, people there. Mm -hmm. Then, uh, uh, then it turned out uh, that the Nazis, uh, the way they <laughs> the way they were, uh, didn't make any big differences between the the Ukrainians and and the Russians. But once they were in. Uh, they treated the Ukrainians, although their leaders, uh, uh, like these people that I mentioned, sort of were uh, actively willing to collaborate with the occupation. Right. They treated them as badly as they they treated everybody else. Uh, so <laughs> equal justice for everyone, yeah, uh, everyone. <laughs> so uh, uh, now uh, the uh, the right wing. Uh, uh, the right wing uh, Ukrainians have a sort of hatred, uh, love hatred relationship to uh, to to Germany, mm -hmm. and the representative of this is the ambassador of uh, of. Oh uh, yeah, he's constantly like lecturing Germans on Twitter. The Ukrainian ambassador in Germany. Yeah, he yeah. and and not not only that. Um, uh, so this, this guy, yeah. Then Germany. This guy Patera, who, who was the the leader of the of the uh, radical fascists, the, the the man named Melnik, strange enough, the same name as 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 the ambassador, was a s somewhat less uh, same name, same uh, Christian name, maybe they are even related. They they uh, 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 they were a little less sort of radical, but but the. Uh, this guy, Patera, ended up no both of them. Both of them ended up in Germany after the war, ah. Be, because they because of course after the Russians had had taken over, uh, they had to get away from there. Mm -hmm. And and like the Croatian fascists, they sort of all lived in the area around Munich, where uh, where the German secret service from the Second World War. Uh, was housed under American protection, the Bundesnachrichtendienst, which, which was sort of taken over by the Americans as a as a special unit, <laughs> just, just as the German rocket scientists uh, like like Werner von Braun and and others. Yeah, so so these people lived around Munich, and this guy Patera died uh, in 1959. He was killed by uh, a, a Russian assassination uh, uh, commando. Yeah, like many of the exiled Croatians who who had been uh, until the end of the war uh, uh, allies of the uh, Germans, mm -hmm. and and this ambassador sort of regularly on the day this guy is shot, this ambassador ma regularly makes a trip to Munich where where he is buried buried, and uh, and sort of lies down a wreath, <laughs> wow. and. And in, a, in an interview with uh, with the Frankfurter Allgemeine, uh, so he, he said, Patera is one of my heroes. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And, wow. And this guy That's wild. is the ambassador of the present uh, uh, government in the most important uh, European country. Uh, his his German is perfect. I think he grew up in Germany. I I, I think he's he's born in Germany as part of this emigre com, com, com community. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, then, and and also he he has a particular admiration on uh, for this Azov uh, uh, regiment. Open openly. Yeah, open. Oh, oh, absolutely. Yes, 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 yes. Jesus. In 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 that the, I'm I'm reading this with. With fascination in that interview uh, that, that he gave to the Frankfurter Allgemeine, 
the the journalist asked him, uh, what, and what what do you say to your Russian friends? And he said, I have no Russian friends. Okay. I never had Russian friends because Russians are by disposition uh, sort of out to destroy the Ukrainian uh, people. Uh, and therefore, you can't talk to them. Now, this guy, this guy is a diplomat. Jesus, yeah. that's wild. Wow. Yeah. But then, but then think about, think about the, uh, the government that sends him. Now, now, these positions are not handed out like, like nothing. You need to have a certain influence in the government. Right. Yeah. Uh, that is, your group has to have a certain influence in the government. Yeah, then the, judging by the presence of this guy in one of the most important European uh, European countries, and the way in which he uh, so, uh, I, I, mean, I mean, I've never never heard of an ambassador who, who acts like this. But Germans like to be insulted, basically. So 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 they uh, uh, they are listening uh, uh, so patiently, and, and they are really shocked and about themselves rather than about him. But, but if this guy is sent by the Ukrainian government to an important country like, like Germany, then there must be a component in that uh, government that uh, corresponds to his views right. and has some sort of significant influence. Of course, of course. And it's very, it's, it's quite disturbing and it'll be interesting to see how that plays out as this goes, goes forward. And I know we're, we're running out of time here because, um, yeah. you know, I just wanted to, I guess, to end on, and this is kind of just a big question to end on, but I think it's an important one. You know, it does seem like perhaps we have a system that's failing right now, a global system that's failing. It's in some level of collapse. Um, I don't think that I don't think that'll mean tomorrow, like the global capitalist system ends, but there's uh, definitely some sort of decay taking place. And so my question for you to end on here is, is there an alternative to the sort of reign of neoliberalism or are we facing, do you think, uh, the prospect of a kind of like lengthy period of sort of destabilization and chaos and kind of staring into the unknown? I know that's a very yeah. big question, but yeah. <laughs> It's like like John Maynard Keynes when when he was asked by a journalist and Professor Keynes, what about the future? And, and, <laughs> yeah, what about the future? <laughs> and, 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 and he he answered, well, uh, the future I think lies ahead. Uh, <laughs> That's a good answer. <laughs> so, so, but but I I would like to say that uh, neoliberalism is I think on its way out. Why? Mm. Because uh, uh, this idea of uh, the new world order uh, bush father uh, of a world with no boundaries with no borders for uh, investment uh, e economy and and so on uh, a world where uh, the same sort of market uh, prevails everywhere around the globe that thing is gone mm -hmm. and and it is sort of gone under in a firestorm uh, of uh, uh, wars and crises as happened since the beginning of the 1990s. There was not a single day uh, after 1990 that the American, that the United States were not at war at some place in the world. That was not the idea of the new world order. <laughs> the new world order was one in which there were no enemies anymore because the enemy has all, had all been destroyed. Yeah. So, so what, what is coming? And, and, uh, the parameters that you have to to think about, and that's the only thing one can say, is that uh, you have ec economic blocks that need to internalize most of the production uh, that they need for the kind of life that they want. In other words, you cannot have global uh, global supply chains anymore. Mm. That will make things more expensive. Then, then you have a very fundamental problem with what the world uh, money order will be. Uh, there's not just the yuan or the renminbi or however they call this thing uh, in, in in China and and the dollar. There's also the new cryptocurrencies that there may be uh, sort of cooperative currencies uh, created by countries like uh, India, Brazil, and and all of these places. The euro, the euro is a big problem for the economic development of uh, of, uh, of of the European Union. 
and and the the kind of uh, expenses that are waiting for Europe with the extension to the east are so unbelievable that that there will be a very big sort of debt problem uh, haunting not just uh, not just Europe but also China incidentally uh, and and the United States. Uh, so money, money, the, the money is a big, big question. Uh, what kind of money w there will be in 20 years from now? I think we, we cannot say that. What kind of global uh, trade and production chains will there be? Uh, we only have the idea that they will be shorter than they are now. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and is there going to be the, uh, the, the possibility of a war? And, and I think absolutely. Yes, I I think absolutely, and 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 it may not start in Europe. It may start somewhere in the uh, Indo-Chinese, uh, mm. uh, in the indo pacific Now it's called the Indo-Pacific, Indo-Pacific by the Americans. It used to be called the South South China Sea. <laughs> <laughs> we can't call it that because then it would suggest that China is geographically close to it. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> and and uh, uh, if, if it starts there, then the, the United States will want to be closely allied, uh, as close sort of auxiliary forces. They will need Europe. Mm -hmm. the, the Brits are out of the European Union now, but they are into this AUKUS pa pact, which, which clearly says that they want to be sort of the vice corporal of the American general, when, when it comes to the battle with <laughs> with China, and and uh, uh, Russia will be on the side of uh, of the of the Chinese, yeah. And and then the question is, what does India do? What does, what 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 does Latin America do? This is the the sort of questions that that you can ask, but you cannot answer them. Uh, all all you know is that I, I at least don't see a constructive idea of how this world could be organized. A constructive idea comparable in its uh, uh, intellectual and, and 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 political potential, with what after 1945 uh, uh, Keynes in 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 Bretton Woods or even the the, the 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 victorious powers in Yalta developed. They at least had an idea of, right. of how to divide scenes of uh, or or places of of influence in inside. The, the the post war world and they had an idea of what sort of money should govern the relationships be, be, between countries nobody nobody has this yet. yeah there's no alter there's no alternative at the moment it's just kind of like what we have and then a future with something different but we don't know what but i guess only time I call it, I call it an in interregnum and 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 this is where we this is where our children don't i i'm 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 gone in a few years but <sighs> Well, it it certainly presents an opportunity, I suppose, uh, to come up with an alternative. Whether that will happen is the question. But on that note, Wolfgang Streak, I want to thank you for joining me for the hour. Um, this was a very, very important, I think, and fascinating conversation. Thank you so much for coming on, and I hope I can have you on again at some point in the future. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much.